Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Out and About in the UK. Coming to you today from the Royal London Hospital here in East London. We're here to meet some of the crew members of London's Air Ambulance Service to find out more about the great work they do here in the city. But first, the Irish Elderly Advice Network held their first older Irish cultural event in the Maisonard Community Hall in Kilburn. And we went along to take a look. I saw Christ today at a street corner stand. In the rags of a beggar he stood, he held ballads in his hand. He was crying out, two for a penny, will anybody come? Nora, tell us about what's happening here tonight. Okay, so tonight we've got a night of Irish culture here in Kilburn, um, and it's been put on by the Irish Elders Culture Office, which is a brand new part of the Irish Elderly Advice Network. So the aim of the Culture Office is to use Irish culture to enhance the lives of older Irish people and their friends and the wider community. So that's what we're doing here tonight. Um, specifically what it was, was an extract from a play called The Nun's Chorus. Um, and this was a play set in 1956 in Galway um, and it's around a group of nuns, but it was written specifically to be performed by older Irish people who hadn't acted before. So um, it's been an um, incredible project to kind of work with people on. We had a brilliant um, professional actress who came and worked with us as well called Jackie Hines. Um, but apart from Jackie, everyone else was you know, completely new to this whole thing. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, there's lots of singing in it and it's also working with the Irish Pensioners Choir. Um, and so they did a spot for the first half and now they're all in there having a lovely dance so that's what's going on tonight and uh i believe your mom wrote the play ah she did yes <laughs> she does she doesn't like people to sort of you know uh know that necessarily but it's a beautiful beautiful play yeah it's quite powerful so mother imelda needs our prayers and our blessings how else is she going to cope with us all we are terrible sinners all of us Yes, we are indeed. Wicked sinners. Dear God. <laughs> <coughs> Sally, you wrote the play that the uh, the guys uh, performed earlier on. Tell us about it. Uh, well, basically it started off as a plea for me to write a sketch because uh, over the years I've written several sketches for them. Um, mostly humorous kind of comedy sketches and they were kind of at me and at me to do some more and I kept putting it on the long finger and eventually um, I went in and sat down and I, I, that's what came out. Uh, it's actually five hours long um, but my daughter Nora did a wonderful editing job on it and reduced it down to two 40, 40 minutes either side. And tonight's performance was a little snippet of it? Yes, tonight's performance was a little snippet. It was the opening scene in the play um, and it was basically setting the scene for um, the life of, of a bunch of nuns in a, an enclosed order of nuns in a convent in Dublin. And it was it, it's a com it's a comedy and it's a bit reflective. I mean, you need to see the whole play to see um, how it develops. But um, the, the shot you saw tonight was just really setting the scene for this very dominant uh, mother superior and her complete control of these nuns. But the play develops into looking at why would women join an enclosed order. We kneel and pray there for the ones that have gone and hope they'd be proud of their wandering song. This is
Jacqueline, you've uh, been working with the, the people here for the last few weeks yeah. and you've, you've trained them up to be actors and actresses. <laughs> Tell us about it. No, I think they're training me. I'm not training them. They're keeping me on my toes, to be honest. I mean, they have such an enormous amount of natural stage presence, which I think you can only get with experience and with age. And, you know, it's a beautiful play written by Sally, rooted in reality. You know, she has experience of those institutions and that way of life. and and a lot of the uh, women in, in, in the pensioners' choir also have a similar experience. And I think that brings something to a story that you can't spin out of nothing. You know, there's a weight with that kind of experience that shows on stage. So although we're all reading the scripts as if it's a radio play, you really buy into the, their experience and their, their heart, you know. I think uh, they do a great job. <laughs> Wallace, uh, you're chairperson of the Irish Elderly Advice Network here in London. Uh, it's a great night here. It's brilliant, isn't it? The atmosphere was great, but the play is much longer and it will be nice when we come back in October. We want to do the full play. We only done a small part of it tonight, but it was great. Tell us about uh, the Irish Elderly Advice Network. You're, you're based in, in Haringey. Uh, the cultural part is based in Haringey, but uh, the office, the Irish Elderly Advice Network, is in the Irish Centre in Camden Town. We rent an office out from there and we've got three workers there and Nora has taken over the cultural office in Haringey. Oh, what's the to do? You know, my hair is black, her eyes are blue. Jill, it's a great night here, I'm sure you agree. Absolutely, it's fantastic. You know, I have to go to lots of events as an MP for the local area and coming to Irish events is one of my favourites just because of all the music you've heard, the songs you've heard, the humour and also just the entertainment value when you come because the main thing is everyone looks like they're enjoying themselves, which is nice. And the Irish population here, traditionally Kilburn was very much an Irish area, but now it's very, very multicultural. Yeah, it is a multicultural area and that's why I love representing Hampstead and Kilburn. But the Irish roots in Kilburn, or County Kilburn as it's often called, um, still stays. And two of our local Labour councillors here, John Duffy and Rita Keneally, have Irish origins as well. And my parents got married here in the 70s and it was almost completely Irish when they lived here. But I feel the Irish community is part of my home. Um, they've always welcomed me. Traditionally, they have supported the Labour Party for years and years and the support they showed me during the election was amazing. Delighted to be here and uh, a great turnout and uh, plenty of Irish and a mixture of the Filipino community came to join us this evening with the local uh, member of parliament, Tulip. Yes, and it's a great mix. A good mix. We're beginning to, uh, uh, we have, in, in, in this parish now for example, it was all Irish one time, it was known as County Kilburn. Now there are 60 nationalities and about 40, 40 different languages. So that's how the community is changing and how we're integrating and how uh, the Irish came here and got a place to stay, got work and then moved on to different parts of, this, uh, different parts of London. Some went back home, some uh, uh, they built up this parish, built up schools, built up community centres and a lot of them also send money back home to build uh, extensions and hay barns and put roofs and houses and put replaced uh, attached with, 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 with slate and with, uh, with uh, and bought bits of land and, and maybe educated the, the, 
their their younger brothers and sisters. So and, and, and looked after themselves. And, and, and they're a great a great generation of Irish people. A great generation of Irish people. And came the, and a lot of them left school after the primary cert and and they had no other place to go but they came here and they appreciated coming here and they worked hard and they made a contribution here and away in back. Many thanks there to Nora Mulready and all the gang there at the Irish LD Vice Network for putting on such a fantastic night. We're going to take a break right now, but do stay with us for the second half of the show. You're very welcome back to the show. I've come along here to London's Air Ambulance Helipad, based at the Royal Hospital in Whitechapel in East London, to find out more about the great work the charity does on a daily basis. Graeme Hodgkins, CEO of the organisation, told us how it all got started. London's Air Ambulance now has been going for 26 years. We were the second air ambulance to be established uh, here in the UK. Uh, and the service was really set up uh, back in 1989 in a direct response to um, a piece of research that was undertaken by the Royal College of Surgeons. And that research simply said that too many people were dying in the capital by the roadside. Uh, hence the Air Ambulance Service was set up back in uh, 1989. And the charitable aspect of the organisation can't be underestimated. You know, there is some public money that is given to the organisation, um, but tell us about the charitable work. Yeah, so the charity element is, is really important, as you say, Ian. Um, we've always been a charity, and, and lots of people in London don't really understand that. They expect us to be funded by the NHS, by the government, and whilst we do get some very critical financial uh, support and, and through the provision of doctors and paramedics to support the service, most of what we do is delivered through the donations of the people and the businesses of London. Uh, and we raise money in a whole variety of ways. We have a lottery scheme. We have around 60,000 chances every week uh, into the lottery. Uh, we're doing much more work with corporate we're working with trusts and foundations and, and livery companies and it's really that charitable element that keeps the helicopter in the skies and delivers this life-saving service to the people of London every single day. Tell us about the current fundraising efforts that's happening right now. Yeah, we have a particular focus right now. Uh, London uh, is probably the only capital city in the world that is reliant on a single emergency medical helicopter. We think that is completely unacceptable. Uh, so over and above just delivering the service day to day, we have been asking the people and businesses of London for an extra £6 million, uh, which is the uh, Your Helicopter, Your London campaign. Uh, delighted to say we've raised around 3.9 of that, so we're well on the way to that much needed second aircraft. But we still need another two 2.1 million to sustain that second helicopter and extend our daylight flying hours for the next five years. So we really need people's support. Myself and my team are in charge of all the safety on the helipad um, regarding fire, fire safety, uh, general helipad safety. Uh, we also do patient handling, restocking of the aircraft and work with the medical team to make sure the aircraft's ready to go at any given moment. London especially is one of the busiest pieces of airspace in Europe, um, so it's very challenging. Um, challenging with high buildings uh, and obstructions. Um, we operate a two crew service here, two pilots, um, to mitigate some of those challenges. There's always one pair of eyes looking out. Uh, and we've got a very good system with air traffic control. Um, a, a square system so we tell air traffic control where we're going 
and they will give us a direct routing as much as possible uh, and priority over all other aircraft in the sky. Uh, London Air Ambulance, it's not just an air, it's also road. Tell us about that. Yes, so um, if it's bad weather or if it's night time, uh, we'll go by car. Uh, exactly the same medical team, exactly the same medical kit. Um, but at the moment, the technology is not there at the moment for us to be flying and landing in an urban area at night. So we use the cars to get the medical teams to the incidents um, to treat the patients on scene. Give us an idea of the, the, the geographical area that London's Air Ambulance covers. Yeah, we mainly cover anywhere within the M25, the orbital motorway around London. So that's between 10, 11 million people on a weekday. Um, we can go outside of that if we're requested to. So if any of the home counties request our services, we can fly out to Kent, Surrey, um, Hertfordshire and Essex, uh, Thames Valley if required. And on average, how many call-outs would, would you have on a daily basis? On average, three or four missions a day is the average for the aircraft and about four to five sometimes missions for the car at night. How, how rewarding do you find working with London Air Ambulance? I think it's one of the most rewarding jobs you can get because you're actually seeing the, the fruits of your work as such. Uh, you see patients in near-death experience or near-death uh, and you get to see them way down the line on their recovery coming up to say thank you. Uh, and you actually realise you were working that day and you helped with their treatment. So it's very rewarding for all the team members here because we've all play an equal part as a team in looking after that patient. We had the train bombings the 7th of July uh, and although it was quite a horrific time, um, to see the team working so close, uh, such a um, such a tight-knit team and, and, and everything working well was actually, um, yeah, it's. It was both a, a horrible day, but actually you were elated that the team did what they were supposed to do and managed the scene as quickly as possible and saved as many lives. So it was like, yeah, it's very difficult to describe, but um, getting the team when they're working at the most extreme is actually very rewarding. Neil, uh, we're here 17 floors above London, it's uh, a beautiful day and um, tell us a little bit about the day-to-day the -day running of London's Air Ambulance. Okay, so the aircraft's based at RF Northolt where it's uh, maintained and cleaned overnight. The pilots will meet there in the morning and prepare the aircraft and then fly to the helipad and be based here for the rest of the day. I'm actually on a late shift today so I'll start flying at 2 o'clock and fly till about 8.30 at night. So the, the aircraft itself, you, you, you leave Northolt, you come in here in the morning, uh, the buzzer rings, what happens next? So the, when the buzzer rings, the co-pilot uh, will take the details of the job uh, via an iPad. The captain will run up the aircraft and get it started and get the medics on board. Uh, by this time we've spoken to Heathrow, uh, air traffic control, and told them roughly where we're going. We'll then get airborne as quick as we can. We aim to be airborne in about three minutes, uh, certainly within four minutes, and then we can fly anywhere in London at 150 miles in a straight line and uh, be anywhere in London within about 11 minutes. And how do you actually physically land an aircraft in a city like this with so many buildings and overhead wires? Do you have a specified landing points around the city or is it all done by, by eye, by, by sight? Yeah, to say we make it up as we go along sounds a little frivolous, but actually um, we, we kind of do. We have two pilots who have been specially trained to, to deal with this sort of environment, which is slightly unique. It's a very busy airspace with the planes around, but very built up and we need to look for places to land at all times. We can land in an area of about a square tennis court, 80 feet by 80 feet and uh, unfortunately when we go overhead we just have to look for the most suitable landing site. We don't have any prepared sites, we have to look for, for the most suitable, safest in proximity with access to the patient that we can. And over the years, you know, you're, you're te over 10 years here with London's Air Ambulance, any particular days stand out? Yeah, so we've had a few, a few interesting days. I, I certainly remember a day uh, on the old helipad. We used to be based at a lower level helipad. A day where we did um, eight missions in a single day, where we hardly got out of the helicopter and just flying to mission mission, which is uh, a particularly busy day. And some other particular landing sites, uh, I remember landing in Trafalgar Square and Piccadilly Circus and Horse Guards Parade, all the, the iconic places of London we, we've uh, had to land before now. Tell us about the aircraft here and what we're looking at behind us. We've got some medical equipment and all sorts of things like that. Uh, how different is this to normal helicopters? 
Yeah, so this is this is a really interesting helicopter. It's it's uh, really designed for utility. You'll notice it doesn't have a tail rotor, which is which is a great uh, luxury to us landing in, in confined areas in London. The rotor blades are very high, so if we land in amongst uh, people or people run up to the aircraft, they're less likely to be struck by a blade. The equipment inside is designed to, to be nearly an intensive care unit. We can fly the enough equipment we need to get to effectively take the hospital to the patient rather than the patient to the hospital. So there's a lot of equipment on board and it includes equipment that we don't know we need. For example, life jackets, fall arrest harnesses, um, things that we might need should we end up on the side of the River Thames, which, which happens. What are the biggest challenges flying helicopters here in London? So it's, it's some of the busiest airspace in the world. We've got Heathrow Airport, one way city airport, another way. There are heli routes designed to allow helicopters to travel around this area as well. So at any time we can be doing particularly a lot of talking. London is unique as well, being in being very highly populated. There are 11 million people within a 600 mile area and a lot of buildings. So there are a lot of cranes, a lot of buildings, trees are growing. It's becoming harder and harder to do our job. So it's a, a particular challenge operating in this area. Is there any, any other similar type organisations in Britain right now? Well, we're lucky. Uh, Great Britain is, is covered by uh, many air ambulances and they all do different roles. Uh, I think we're the only one dedicated to, to purely a, an urban environment. But I think uh, if you are in trouble anywhere in, in the UK, you're, you're likely to get an air ambulance pretty quickly. The aircraft here is the only one in London. Um, there's a lot of fundraising efforts happening for a second aircraft. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this is really important. Helicopters are, are finely tuned and need to be maintained to, to a high degree, particularly flying over highly uh, built up areas. I think um, we have to take the aircraft offline every night just to look after it, to maintain it and fix it. Uh, last year we were offline for about 55 days uh, and those were days where the weather might have been good enough and we should have been flying around. Getting a second aircraft will allow us to fill that gap and we should be able to provide a helicopter every single day that the weather is suitable. If people want to support London's Air Ambulance, how can they do that? Yeah, in lots of ways. I mean, go to the website, all the details are there. Uh, go to yourhelicopter.london and there are a whole variety of ways that people can donate to the charity. They can do uh, challenge events like Brendan and Jerry are doing for us right now. Uh, they can volunteer their time, their expertise. They can talk to their friends. They can get their companies involved. There's no shortage of ways to support this life-saving charity. So would urge people to come along and help us out at this very critical time. And the website? is www.londons with an s airambulance.co.uk Well many thanks there to all the crew members of London's Air Ambulance for taking the time out of their very busy schedule to speak to us today. If you'd like to contact the show send an email to ian at irishtv.ie and you can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Unfortunately that's all the time we have right now but do come back to us next week when we'll be out and about in the UK.